everybody, Sean here. Hopefully you know who I am by now. Hope you're having a great day. Today I'm going to answer some questions that have been submitted. There were five questions submitted, so I'm going to go ahead and answer them here in a Facebook Live because we're going to create some new processes for getting you quicker answers and having them easier to search and send you out daily emails for this stuff. So the first question comes from Miss Heather Brockman. And Heather says, I am wondering how to handle my management team fraternizing with my grooming staff outside of working hours. Background, I want everyone in the company to get along, but I'm hearing and seeing members of my management team hanging out with the groomers and this has caused issues in the past. Groomers expecting better shifts, dogs, special privileges, etc. Where can I cross the where can I cross the line as a leader between making sure work stays professional or is what they do on their personal time none of my business? This is a great question. I have not only had team members fraternizing with employees, but I have fraternized when I had my last company to be perfectly uh, transparent. You know, this is an HR question. And whenever we're looking at making decisions for our company that could have legal consequences, it's really important to have some sort of HR person or consultant chime in to help you with these types of issues. Think about this. Where do most people meet the person that they end up dating? At work. This is just something that happens because we spend so much time working that we end up meeting people at work to date. It's common. What's really important is to just make sure that we have a policy in our handbook uh, on how we want to address that as a company. As a boss and employer, I kind of want to stay out of that. I like to have an arm's length diff, you know, uh, uh, distance between me making comments and, and talking about stuff like that unless it becomes an issue. Uh, but this is where your training, your handbook, and your policies from a human resource perspective are going to come into play. If it were me, I would hire an outsourced HR person um, and have a policy written for the company. Marsha, she's going to be a great person to answer this question for you because that's kind of what she does as a, as a company. I'll make sure that Marsha answers this question for you as well um, when I forward this over to uh, Honey to have other mentors answer this for you. But it's really just important to have a great policy on this for your company so that you're maintaining the letter of the law you want to make sure that anything, I'm repeating this, anything that could create any type of litigiousness, if that's a word, any type of legal matter for your company, it's really important that you abide by your state and federal laws as it relates to this stuff. Um, I remember that we used to have something in our handbook about this. I don't remember what it was. Um, but if it were today, I would just reach out to an HR consultant. But I'm, uh, I'm going to get Marsha to answer this for you as well, okay? Um, all right, the next question comes from Allison Koyanagi. And Allison says, how do I hire and train someone to take over my day-to-day -day duties? The background. Digital marketing agency. I work a lot in my business, and it feels... I, it feels like I, it prevents me from doing or focusing on things I love to do. I also want to start a few more businesses and focus on hobbies as well. How do I hire and train someone to replace me in the day-to-day -day operations? And most of all, how do I get them to be as motivated and as invested as I am as the owner? Would you recommend I give them some equity in the business so they feel like they are contributing to something they can help to grow? Thank you for your help in business. All right, thank you for your help and expertise. Okay, so I'm feeling a lot of red flags in your question here, Allison. A lot of red flags. The first thing that comes to my mind is, here is an entrepreneur saying, I wanna hire someone to just take over my business so I can do other things. I don't think that that exists. 
You're the owner. I'm the owner of my business. There is nobody on the face of the planet that will be more passionate and know my business better than me. It just does not exist. I can hire a CEO and, a, and give them duties of a CEO, visionary, growing the business, and all those types of things. I can hire a CEO, but they will never be as passionate about my business that I will. Any employee that I hire will never be as passionate as I am, even if they own a percentage of the company. They're gonna be as passionate as they can be, but it will never be as passionate as I am as the owner and founder of my company. It just does not exist. Um, so that's the, a big red flag to me. It feels to me like that might be you saying I'm burnt out, I'm not making enough money, I'm not having enough fun. I'd like to understand more of what's going on in your mindset. Maybe book a get out of jail call with me, Allison but there's a lot of red flags in your question and description here. But to elaborate and try to dig in a little bit more on answering this for you, you can hire people to perform roles in your company. All you have to do is say, what role do I want filled? Do your research to determine what it would cost to hire someone to fill that role? Put an ad out there and go out there and hire somebody. You're never gonna get someone, as, like I said, that's gonna be as passionate, but they can perform roles for your company. And the way to do that is the same information that we've been giving you since you joined AO. By creating more sales in your company, that will create more cash flow, and that more cash flow will give you the budget to hire people to do the things that you don't want to do in your business. And when, you're, when we're gonna hire people to do things that we don't want to do in our business, it's gonna take money, right? So we have to have cash flow, which means we gotta go make more sales to create more cash flow. It all starts with sales. Go get more money to hire people to do the things that we want them to do in our company. This is why I just hired an AO, a connection manager, because my time got too um, limited to be able to speak to all couple hundred members of AO on a proactive basis to reach out, to see how you're doing, see how I can help you, and I just didn't have enough time in the day. So I said, okay, I need to increase some cash flow, which I did, so that I could hire somebody, which I know will then drive more revenue and allow me to focus on other areas of the business. Same thing with your business. Drive more sales, create more cash flow, hire people to do the things that you don't want to do. But don't confuse or, or fool yourself into thinking that anybody's ever gonna be as passionate about your business as you will. Another good thing to look at that is, is this. There's a couple people in the group, like Nick, like Heather. They, when I first met them, they were in your situation. They were working really hard in their business. They had hardly any time off. And I said, hey, listen, if you focus on increasing your sales, at some point, you're gonna be able to take off and you're gonna be able to go on vacation. You're gonna be able to do the things that you wanna do and enjoy your life. And when you're gone, your company's gonna make just as much money as if you were there. So when you build a million dollar, multi-million dollar company, you're gonna have the ability to take off more time to focus on hobbies and other things that you wanna do. And you're gonna have people running your business for you. But you gotta, we have to get the revenues up in order for you to get to that position. You're not gonna be able to hire five, 10 people to run your agency if you're only doing $100,000, $200,000 a year in revenue. Just not gonna happen. Equity is nice, and it's nice to, to give somebody some equity, but at the end of the day, people need paychecks to work. And so that's the first focus. I hope that answers your question. Looking forward to more dialogue. If you need to book a get out of jail call with me, book a call. Okay, the next question comes from Yolindi. And Yolindi says, advice on adding a subscription model to our business. We're looking at finding an artist that has a large Instagram presence to network with to do pillow designs for the subscription. Thus, it will automatically help grow the awareness and launch our line. We design and make 
decorative pillow covers. We want to plan out the implementation of a subscription base and value input and advice as the best way to go about it. We're thinking to give a free pillow insert when you subscribe. Customers simply swap out the cover each month as a new one arrives. We are wanting to offer two types of design choices, scripture based or inspirational based. Also for retention, offering a free birthday pillow cover. Okay, so I'm, I think I wasn't sure what the question was. It sounds like you want to start a subscription company, a subscription business where people get a pillow and then every month they get different covers. Okay, so the business model is you need to create some sort of marketing and sales funnel and you want to maybe use Instagram influencers to do this. Um, I'm not sure what you're asking here. You're looking for advice on adding a subscription model. Um, I'm not sure what your question is here, Yolindi, because you're looking for advice on a subscription model and it sounds like you already have the subscription model played out. Um, if it were me, and I'm gathering, trying to gather what you're saying, is I would figure out how much you can pay an influencer, put together maybe a test pilot of um, a focus group maybe, and ask people their opinion. How much would they pay? Would they have interest in paying for a subscription? It sounds like you're still kind of in the feasibility study or market research to determine if that business model of a subscription service for pillow covers is even a, 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 a business that people would pay for, a, a subscription people would pay for. So what I might do is I might reach out to my current email list and say, we're thinking about starting a subscription service. Here is what it's gonna do. Would you please fill out this survey so we can determine if there's a need for this, determine if it's something that people would pay for. Um, I think I would do that first, or I might have a Facebook group or something. I would want to, to verify that there are people that would be willing to pay for this type of service before I would launch it. I would wanna go out there and get some feedback first. Um, so that would be my advice. I hope I'm answering your question here. It was a little foggy on what your actual question was, but that's what I would do is I would go do a focus group first and, and confirm that the business model is actually a good business model before you launch it. Okay, I hope that helps. Okay, the next question comes from Carlos and Carlos says, should I keep my e-com store or, should I keep my e-com store a general store or should I go down to a specific category and just make the website that category? The background is I have a 5K general product store and haven't gotten any real advice if I should keep it as is or focus on specific category and just sell that on my store. I feel like I'm all over the place when it comes to advertising products and would love some advice. Okay, so Carlos, you and I had a conversation about this. For everybody watching, Carlos bought from some generic company an e-commerce store that was pre-made done for he he figured out the domain and then this company uploaded through drop ship drop shipping on aliexpress five thousand different products um and then carlos is supposed to figure out a way even though he doesn't know how how to go drive traffic to this e-commerce website for people to buy products that are just drop shipping, which means Carlos doesn't have a brand. He doesn't know who the ideal client is. He hasn't built up his own audience. He hasn't really done any type of advertising and he just has this store. How many of you that have ever heard of this type of thing? So I had a conversation with Carlos and I said, Carlos, if it were me, I would back up. What kind of business are you trying to create? Who is, what's the vision of your company? Are you just trying to make a quick buck or are you trying to build a real business with a real brand? And I put Carlos into an e-commerce Facebook chat group with five or six other people that have done kind of what Carlos is doing and I taught those people that they need to build a real business. So 
I said, I want you to go into the resource center, into the branding section, and I want you to read about what it's like to build a real brand. Right now, you don't have a brand. You have this online store with 5,000 different products all over the place and with no clear message, no clear who's the ideal customer. There's no way to really advertise that store because it's not really narrowed down. So yes, to answer your question, I would get niche. Serve a very specific audience. Like there's a guy here in the group, Tim Schaefer, who has an e-commerce store. And he's working with Joel Gandera, who's an e-commerce mentor. And, and he has a very specific type of client that he, an audience that he knows that his products are for them. So he built out a brand. So the advice I gave you was go read all the articles on building out a brand. Who do you want to serve? What's your vision for the company? What's your mission statement? What are your core values? What makes you unique? Who's your ideal client? What's the buyer persona of that type of client? When you know the answer to all of those questions, you'll know how to go find those people. When you put together an advertising campaign, whether it be on Facebook or Instagram or Google AdWords or Google SEO, you're going to be able to write your copy and do your ads specific for that type of client. Right now, yes, you're all over the place. Bring it back in and start figuring out what kind of online business you want to build. What is your brand going to stand for and who is the exact customer? Who is the type of audience, the customer that you really want to go after? That's your advice. There's no quick, easy way to do this. This is like business 101. The other advice I had given you was to go read all of the articles in the categories in the resource center around starting a business and business planning. You didn't do any business planning in any way, shape or form. You saw some ad on social media about buy a custom done for you Shopify store and make hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you're now seeing that that doesn't exist. You, you didn't do any type of business planning. That company didn't do any business planning. They didn't teach you how to do marketing. They didn't teach you how to do the advertising. They just connected you to all these products on AliExpress. Now it's time for you to start building a real business. Read all those articles in the resource center and start answering the questions of what type of business you want to build. That's what we're here for. So ask some questions around that, but go read all that information. Slow down, take your time, and go through all those articles. This is what being a business owner and an entrepreneur is all about. This is the hard part, but once you get through this, you'll have more clarity in what type of business that you want to build. All right? Okay. Yes, Christopher, I know you know that feeling as well. Okay, and the last question comes from Heather Brockman as well. And Heather says, is there an average training period I should be working towards with me with my new hires. We, are, we currently have our on-the-job training set at 80 hours to cover all aspects of the company, the processes, the vehicles, and this is all followed by a test to make sure they understand and can implement everything. It's paid training, of course, but for groomers who are used to making commission, it is a drastic change, $100 a day for paid training. This may have cost me a new hire. I'm now wondering, do I keep the training thorough and a mandatory 80 hours so it is the same across the board or do we tweak it for each person? You know, I think that's up to you, Heather. Um, you know, it I think it would depend. If somebody already knows what they're doing and you're not having to teach them certain aspects of dog grooming, and, but they need to understand your processes, maybe that's 20 hours of training. Maybe that's 40 hours of training. Maybe it is 80 hours of training. I'm not sure, but I'm always very careful to just put everybody into a certain cardboard box when it comes to training. Um, because some people might be more experienced and they don't need certain aspects. So I would look to review that in my training when I train people. There's kind of a two, you know, a way to look at it is I want to train somebody on how to do it, then I want them to shadow me so I can show them how to do everything. 
and then I want to shadow them to make sure that they are doing everything according to the brand standards and the processes that I set place, then I want to turn them loose. So I think that that's kind of up to you. There's no standard, but I would be very careful to treat everybody the exact same as far as all the training. You might have, we're going to teach you this, 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 and this, but if you already know how to do that, we don't need to put you through 20 hours of that if you already know how to do it, you know, just for the sake of checking the box. But when it comes to Heather's Mobile Pet Grooming brand standards and the way that you do things that might be different than the way they did them at their previous position or previous company they work for, those are things that we do want to make sure that we're sticklers about. And if you talk about that on the, on, uh, in the interview stage, that listen, if, when, if and when you're offered a position to be a groomer for Heather's Mobile Pet Grooming, you need to know you must go through this X amount of training and the pay for that is this. Do you want this position and are you acknowledging that you are going to go through this and this is what your pay is? The more advanced notification and knowledge they have that this is part of the process, at least then when they do come on board, it's not a surprise. They're going to get paid $100 a day. It just is what it is. Or can you pay more? You know, if you know you've got a good groomer and you don't want to lose them, don't just pay them $100 for training. Figure out what you could afford to pay them on. You know, though that's the beauty of owning your own business. You get to make the rules on whatever you want uh, on this type of stuff. So ask yourself, is this just a one-off that this person didn't make it because they couldn't, they didn't want to do the $100? Or is this a, a global problem for my business? If it's, I've never had a problem with groomers in the past, this person just didn't want to do it, well, then you know that person might not just be the right person for Heather's mobile pet grooming. But if it's a global problem, then we might want to look at the processes and the pay that we're using. All right? I hope that helps. Okay, so that's all the questions for today. I'm going to log off, and I'm going to log back in and do another Facebook Live, and I'll be right back. All right? Hope you are good, McBond. Anisa, good to see you. Christopher, good to see you. I'll see all of you soon.